And here's an example of that, what India shouldn't do, run its economy as per the whims of one leader. Xi Jinping's policies have driven China's economy into the ground. His Belt and Road Initiative led to high levels of debt. His obsession with zero COVID infected the economy. And his crackdowns on business leaders have driven away investors. The result is this. China is struggling. Businesses are leaving and Xi Jinping is trying to win them over. Today, the Chinese president made a pledge. He has promised to do right by foreign investors. Let me quote from what Xi Jinping has said. We will continue to vigorously promote high-level opening up and better protect the rights and interests of foreign investors per the law. That's what Xi Jinping told New Zealand's Prime Minister. His name is Chris Hipkins. He's on an official visit to Beijing. And she told him that China is opening up again. Yesterday, the Chinese Premier made a similar pitch. He tried to reassure investors. Beijing is trying very hard to reverse the slump, but it's not finding many takers. Especially after today's revelations. Headlines like these. A major corruption scandal has come to light. Turns out local governments in China are cooking up their books. They're inflating their revenue through phony asset sales. A number of bogus deals have come to light. Some 70 regions, 70, 70 regions are said to have falsified their records in China. They inflated their revenue by $12 billion. Let me explain how this happened. This is mainly about land deals. Now, usually regional governments sell land to private players, to property developers who then build apartments or commercial properties. This is how it works and this is normal practice. It's also a major source of revenue for local governments. But in recent months, China's real estate sector has hit a slump. So the demand for land has shrunk. Fewer developers are buying land from local governments. And so government revenue has taken a hit. And government officials have come under pressure because their books are not looking good. Some of them started cooking up land deals. They created phony buyers on paper. They falsified records and showed land sales on their books which was all fake. In reality, some officials were just transferring ownership on paper and the land in question was still in government control. It had not been sold. All they did was change the names to create an illusion of an actual purchase. Subsequently, government revenues were inflated. We are talking about fake revenues up to $12 billion. Why do you think they did this? Because Chinese officials are desperate. They face large debt obligations and they don't have the money to repay those debts. These are government debts we are talking about, not personal debts. Local governments in China are buried under loans. At the end of last year, they owed more than $8 trillion. We've told you about this before, $8 trillion. This debt has gone out of control. Land sales would have helped but there was no demand for land. So local governments could not raise money. In fact, land sales have been an essential source of their income. In 2021, they accounted for more than 40% of local government revenue, the sale of land. Last year, sales were down by 23%, and this market may not see a revival anytime soon. So with their back against the wall, local officials started cooking their books. And this is not limited to one or two cases. As many as 70 regions in China have inflated their revenues in this manner. Now, when stories like these come out, what message do they send to global investors? The Chinese economy is built on a foundation of deception. Their data was never reliable. Now, even their growth projections cannot be trusted. The heavy burden of debt will add to the mistrust. The phony records will diminish investor confidence. There was a time when global investors swore by China's growth story. That time is past. China is now turning into an example of what not to do. China's domestic problems seem never-ending, but that hasn't stopped it from playing the perfect host. Almost every week, a world leader is in Beijing. As we speak, the New Zealand Prime Minister is there. Soon it could be the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu. They don't have a date yet, but Netanyahu has told U.S. congressmen that he'll soon visit China. Some of them were in Jerusalem, and that's when he dropped the news. And now it's making headlines. Although this won't be his first visit to China, he's been there before, thrice. So this will be his fourth time in China as prime minister, but it's feeding a lot of chatter because A, America is Israel's biggest and closest partner, America and China are at odds, and Netanyahu's visit at a time like this sends a message. And B, 
He's not been to the U.S. in this term yet, but he's talking about going to China, which makes you wonder what's going on between Netanyahu and Biden. You see, Benjamin Netanyahu was elected as prime minister last December. It's almost been six months, 180 days, but he's got no invite from the White House. These two countries, the U.S. and Israel, are as close as they get. Israel is America's biggest ally in West Asia. America gives Israel billions in aid every year. It's been called an unbreakable bond. But it seems the Biden administration is not feeling it. They're keeping Netanyahu at an arm's length, not sending him an invite and disagreeing with him publicly. This happened in March over Netanyahu's proposed judicial overhaul. A deeply unpopular move. It triggered the biggest protest in Israeli history. They were close to a civil war then. Among the protesters was the U.S. president. He said Netanyahu should drop the plan. They cannot continue down this road. And uh, I've sort of made that clear. I hopeful, Hopefully uh, the prime minister will act in a way that he can try to work out some genuine compromise. But that remains to be seen. Now, that's a public rebuke of a close ally. Obviously, it did not go down well with Israel, but Netanyahu played it down. He said friends sometimes do have disagreements. Listen to this. You know, Israel and the United States uh, have had their occasional differences. But I want to assure you that the alliance between the world's greatest democracy and a strong, proud, and independent democracy, Israel, in the heart of the Middle East, is unshakable. Nothing can change that. You heard that. An unshakable alliance, he said. But are Israel and the U.S. still as tight as they claim? Netanyahu is not new to politics. He's been prime minister for 15 years, Israel's longest serving prime minister, in fact. He's dealt with multiple U.S. presidents. He's navigated changing relations and equations. He did not share a great rapport with Barack Obama, and now he's getting a snub from Joe Biden. So he's going for the second best option, it seems, and that is China. He knows that U.S.-China relations are at an all-time low. He also knows that his visit to China will make the Americans sit up. But that may not be his only purpose. He may want to achieve more than sending a message to Washington, D.C. Which brings us to the China-Israel relationship. First, the numbers. Trade was at more than $9 billion in the year 2012. By 2022, it almost touched $22 billion. China has been investing in Israel despite the roadblocks from the U.S., and there have been roadblocks. So both sides have been going slow. Plus, China's historic support to Palestine has posed problems for Tel Aviv. And yet, Netanyahu has persisted. In 2017, he called the Israel-China relationship a marriage made in heaven. Well, he said this about India, too, so it makes you wonder if this is his favorite phrase. In his personal life, he's been married thrice, so... Do your math. Anyway, the question now is, is he going to China to consummate this marriage? He's an astute politician. The world around him is changing very fast. And China is playing a big role in that. Recently, Beijing brokered a peace deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia. For Israel, Iran is a sworn enemy and Saudi Arabia a coveted partner. Israel also wants to normalize ties with the Saudis. Some help from the Chinese would be welcome. So that's one reason. The second reason could be the Israel-Palestinian conflict, the holy grail of foreign policy, as it were. Every U.S. president has tried and failed. Now China wants to mediate. This month, China hosted Palestinian president Mahmoud Abbas. So is it now Netanyahu's turn? Will he engage with China on the question of Palestine? Honestly, we don't know yet. But either way, China may be the winner here. The Israeli leaders visit sends a message, a strong message to the U.S. It also marks another interesting turn in the politics of West Asia. We'll be tracking it for you. If you could go back in time, what would you do differently? That's a question that over 51 million people face today. We're talking about the people of South Korea because, believe it or not, they have become younger overnight. At least according to a new law in their country, it says South Korea will now adopt the international aid system, a way to calculate age which is used by most of the world. Earlier, Koreans used other systems, other systems to calculate what they call the Korean age. Now that has been scrapped. And this has ended years of debate. Our next report tells you more. 
South Koreans woke up yesterday to find themselves a year or two younger because the East Asian country's government has passed a new law. It has adopted the international age system, ditching its traditional system to count age. And for most, this is good news. According to traditional Korean aid system, I'm supposed to be 30 next year. But with this new aid system, I became two years younger. It's just great to feel like you're getting younger and I feel a bit of distance from becoming 30. I'm so happy that I can celebrate this year's birthday once again in younger age. I'm going to study abroad in the UK. So I think it's less confusing that I don't need to explain my Korean age anymore. I can just say my international age in other countries since we have adopted the international aid system. We used to use our international age and official documents, so I don't think this will be a big change. But my friends and I are excited about becoming two years younger. South Korea has three different age systems. Yes, three. The first, as we mentioned earlier, is called international age. It refers to the number of years since a person was born. So this count starts at zero. It's what most of the world uses. But for South Koreans, it's usually used in formal settings, like on legal documents. And matters get complicated in informal settings, where people often share their Korean age. This system has its roots in China, where babies are considered a year old on the day they're born, and a year is added every January 1st. In simple terms, Korean age makes people a year or two older than their international age. But this isn't all. South Koreans also have a calendar age, which is a remix featuring both international and Korean age. Here, babies are zero years old on the day they're born, but a year is added to their age every January 1st. Let us give you an example. Take the Korean star Sai, singer of Gangnam Style. He was born on December 31st, 1977. By international age, he's 45. By calendar age, 46. And by Korean age, he's 47 years old. Sounds confusing, right? That's because it is. Also, increasingly unpopular. People have to switch between different age systems regularly. The confusion it spurs has caused disputes in the country. People have had to pay unnecessary social costs due to a mixed use of age standards. The government held a poll recently. 86.2% of respondents said that they want to use the international age system. But it's not just the people. The government too had been in favour of this move for a while now. It's been a major pledge by President Yoon suk yeol we expect that legal disputes, complaints and social confusion that have been caused over how to calculate ages will be greatly reduced. Even with the new standardization, the old systems will still be used in some circumstances, like elementary school admissions or alcohol and tobacco consumption, which are based on the year someone is born in, regardless of month. So, while the system may still be a tad bit confusing, it is definitely simplified by leaps and bounds with this law. And for South Koreans, this was much awaited. After all, sometimes age is more than just a number. Before I begin my next story, let me ask you a weighted question. Have you ever been concerned about your weight gain? Have you been conscious about being large of thigh and round of belly? Have you ever dreamed of a drug that could render you slender? According to drug makers, your wait is over because we are living in a weight loss revolution which has taken another dramatic turn. Ellie Lilly, a drug maker, has developed an experimental weight loss shot, an injection to help you lose weight. It's being hailed as the strongest weight loss treatment yet. It works a lot like other similar drugs. It tinkers with the body's hormones that control appetite. And the result? Obese patients shed about 24% of their body weight after 48 weeks. Some 26 kilos of weight loss in almost a year. Honestly, these results are mind-blowing, much higher than any other anti-obesity medication. And that's saying something, because as you may know, there are numerous players in the weight loss game, like Novo Nordisk, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and Amgen. From jabs to pills, they offer a crop of solutions. And they may differ in their response,
but they all promise one thing, a slimmer world. But here's the skinny. Over the past decade, these treatments have offered very little benefit and too many side effects. But now Lily's newest drug has set the bar much higher by showing that weight can be dramatically cut down by a simple injection. It is already one of the most valuable drug makers in the world. And after the news of this drug, its shares have risen sharply, which only goes on to show that Lilly may take the lead in the weight loss market, a market which is predicted to reach $150 billion within the next decade. So weight loss will be rivaling cancer treatments. Tells you something about our world. Drugs that help you shed weight come with a heavy price tag. Every month, an average user must shell out more than $900 for these drugs. Very expensive for a medicine, unaffordable for many. Yet the demand continues to surge because people see value in these drugs. For some, they're the weapon of choice in the battle of beauty. For others, they can be a lifesaver. Today, 38% of the world population is overweight or obese. That's about 2.5 billion people, 2.6 billion people. In 12 years' time, this will increase to 51%. That's more than 4 billion people. And obesity is harmful to health. No two ways about it. it. It can cause diabetes and heart disease. It does sound morbid, right? So people continue to embrace this drug-fueled anti-obesity revolution and enter a new territory where metabolism is manipulated. And apart from the cost, there's also a metaphorical price to pay. Most of these drugs, including Lily Shot, come with a range of similar side effects like nausea, diarrhea, vomiting, constipation. And these issues only get worse as the dosage increases. Some even experience skin tingling and increased heart rate. And all of these side effects are known. Yet these drugs continue to fuel a frenzy among patients. They're causing a gold rush within the pharma industry, which for decades has been seeking its holy grail, a drug that can safely help people shed pounds. The fact is, scientists are still learning how to harness the link between our brain and our gut. So weight loss drugs are going through a series of trials, jumping through the hoops to prove their worth. And so is Lily's supposed miracle shot. Its efficacy and safety still needs to be confirmed in a larger trial. And further study in the field is required across the board. But you don't need to see the results to catch the excitement in the air, really, because those who are desperate to shed weight are willing to shed hundreds of dollars for any new potentially successful anti-obesity drug, even if it comes with risks. After all, there's a price for everything. And for all the talk about body positivity and embracing yourself for who you really are, the desire for weight loss continues to drive a very big market.